Hi, welcome to another Table Talk. This is Israel Anderson. I have heard from so many people that I'm taking the Bible out of context. And that's always interesting to me because we talk a lot about context, don't we? And we actually have a, a free guide that I made many, many years ago. And I just updated it. And here it is. We'll look at this in just a second. Um, to help us find the correct context in the Bible. What's really going on here what people really mean is you are taking the Bible out of the Christian context. Ah, yes, yes, I am. Because my studies of the Bible have shown that the Christian context cannot be defended by a holistic understanding of the Bible. The Bible tells a very different story to Christianity. That's what we explore here. So, how do we find all of these things? How do we know if we're not using a predefined context, the Christian context, a pretext? How do we know that we're interpreting things correctly and in context? Well, a few questions as we are walking through the text, just like we do with the five questions. This is the best way to introduce a person to Jesus. I talk about it all the time. Get a person to start in the Gospel of John with these five questions. What did Jesus say about himself, his father, what he came to do, where he came from, and what will soon take place? Questions. Good questions bring us to good answers, bring us to understanding. So let's take a look at what we've got here. Uh, how to understand the text by expanding context. And this is a very simple thing, right? All it is here, um, oh, I just realized I hadn't even finished it off here. I'm going to add a little blurb here. I kind of already have this in it, but I just thought I would make it a little more pronounced uh, about the historical and cultural context. A lot of my early teachings is about the historical and cultural context, a lot of the Hebraic context the Jewishness of the text. Spent a lot of time, a lot of part of my life in ministry, immersed in the Hebraic context of the Bible, uh, which is how I ended up finding a lot of these other things. So if you're not looking for context, you're starting with a pretext. And of course, this is what every single Christian does. You have to be able to let go of the Christian context. You have to be able to come along to what you're reading and I'll just read it here because I've got it here, right? Forget what you think you know about a passage and look with fresh eyes. You know, I practice blank slating. And that means I'll come to well, anything in life, but you come to a passage and you practice letting go of everything you think you know about it. I know nothing. I'm brand new. There's nothing in this passage I'm even remotely familiar with. I need to look at every single word that's here and understand what is trying to be conveyed through the text here. It's not, not easy to do it, and it's even harder if you already have a pretext like Christianity to separate that and say, oh, no, 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 I can't leave all that behind. I can't look with fresh eyes because I know what this means, because my religion informs me of what it means. That's a pretext. And if that's your starting point, you're never going to understand the Bible. You have to be able to blank slate it. You have to be able to approach the text and say, I know nothing. Let's start afresh. Start from scratch. Let's learn everything we can. This is by no means a scholarly tool, but it's a fantastic beginner tool. If you haven't studied the Bible, and I tell you, there's a very big difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible. There's, you can read the Bible in a month. I mean, you can read the Bible in a week if you kind of do it with God's iPod, my, my own free Bible ministry, where you can listen to it in audio and you can speed it up. And the good thing about speeding up the Bible in audio is it's so fast you have to pay attention and you don't get distracted so easily. I, I really love that. Okay. Uh, what is the historical and, and cultural context 
Uh, so I could say here, uh, what do we know <clears throat> um, from uh, the Hebrews and their understanding? Okay, um, and it, it's possible that it's nothing, <clears throat> but it's also possible that there's going to be something really important there. Okay, um, pull out from a passage. What happened before and after the passage? Now, this is kind of the most basic thing you can possibly do. I, I get this a lot um, when when people give me certain passages. Um, uh, there is like people ask me about when uh, Yeshua Jesus recited the Shema, um, and here he's he's saying you know that that Yahweh is one and He is God alone, and people will come to me and say, "What do you what do you I mean this contradicts what you're saying," but it doesn't if you have a bit of context. And they always start with verse 29, and they don't give me verse 28 because verse 28 sets the context. So you've got to look at before and after. Jesus was asked a very specific question. What is the most important commandment under the law? And he answered correctly. And that's the only answer he could have given. So Jesus is not saying he endorses it, He's answering someone's question, and then he adds his own little add-on, says, you know, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Context is that important. If you're not prepared to look at the text in context, and I've had so many uh, discussions, arguments, uh, over this passage, and it is, it is phenomenal how none of them care about the, the fact that Jesus was asked a question by somebody. So it's like, no, 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 no. He said this, and it's like, okay. This is what we're overly familiar with. I've you know, spent my entire life in Christian ministry. People don't want to take the Bible in context. They want to take it in the Christian context. And then, as you well know, we've got different Christian contexts that spread across the body, all different denominations and things, have all different contexts and beliefs and everything. I mean, imagine a Mormon context or a Jehovah's Witness context is so radically different. Uh, and yet they all claim to be Christian, right? So pull out from the passage what happened before and after the passage. Um, this is elementary. You don't need anything else other than the Bible that's in your hands to do that one, all right? Who wrote the passage and what do we know about them? Who were they writing to and what do we know about them? When did they write it? What was happening at that time? Where were they when they wrote it? Does that tell us anything? Who are the characters in the passage? And here you really start to learn things. Let's say there's a conversation going on between Nicodemus and the Lord in John 3. Who is Nicodemus? And how does that impact his conversation with Jesus? There's a lot of people that think, well, you know, Nicodemus was a bit of a dimwit because he didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. But he did understand what Jesus was talking about. And when you understand who he is and what, what role he played, then that becomes more clear. So who are the people that are involved and what do we know about them? Very important. Are you trying to turn something that is not a metaphor into a metaphor because you don't understand it? Understanding takes time. There are many obvious metaphors in the text, but when it's not an obvious metaphor, resist trying to invent one. Be comfortable with not knowing. Seek understanding. Now, I'm going to talk about this for a second. I get called a Gnostic all the time. Now, uh, if you're just looking at the word gnosis, then it has a very generic meaning. But when Christians are using it, they mean Christian Gnosticism. These are people that are reading and relying on the Nag Hammadi Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas and other extra-biblical work. Now, I look at lots of other extra-biblical work and evidence. 
But what's in the Nag Hammadi Gospels isn't of great interest to me and certainly has not influenced anything whatsoever that I talk about, that I teach, period. I can say that absolutely unequivocally. I teach the Bible. I teach what Jesus says. I don't teach Christian Gnosticism. Now, one of the reasons I get that levied at me is because of this kind of thing with metaphor. Uh, there's a lot of the Bible that has been turned into metaphor because it's not understood, literally, uh, or because they don't want the literal understanding to come through, uh, and probably for all other kinds of reasons as well. But there is a tendency to say to, like, you'll hear a new believer will have a question and say, well, okay, but what about this? And you hear this so often. Well, I know it says that, but let me explain what it actually means. And you get this all the time. And sometimes that's valid. Sometimes there's so much additional context that needs to come into play to explain something uh, that what's right there on the surface is not so easy to understand. Um, turning the other cheek uh, is one of those examples of a man slaps you on one side of the cheek, turn the other to him and let him slap the... Well, look, there's a whole background historical understanding that has to come into play as to what is actually going on there with that. So it's not that there aren't incidents like that, but there is this tendency that when we come along to a passage that is really important to Christian theology, Christian belief, they will enforce it as being really literal, like God is spirit. Well, so am I but I also have a physical form. You are spirit. I am spirit. God is spirit. But we all, all have physical forms. All right? Um, so in that case, it's like super literal. No, God is spirit. It's like, well, wait a second. That has to be taken in context. No, no, no. It just says God is spirit. And they'll get boisterous. So, well, you just accept the words. It's like, and then... With the majority of the rest of the text, it's like, well, let me tell you what that actually means. Like John 8, 44, where Jesus plainly, explicitly says, your father, who they just identified as Yahweh, is the devil. And then describes this individual, a lying murderer from the beginning, the Genesis. Oh, we see the same with descriptions in other places. And there, you know, it's like, no, actually, they were worshipping, they were hypocrites, they were doing this, and there's all these stories that have been created to try to turn John 8, 44 into something other than the single most damning verse in the entirety of the Bible, where Jesus absolutely nails Yahweh and says, he is the devil. All right. Um, I'm a biblical literalist. I am quite a radical biblical literalist. My first approach to the text is a literal one. As the literal understanding of that passage is shining at me, I then start to go through all of these kinds of filters and try to pull out the context of what I'm looking at so that we can end up truly understanding what we're reading. But they accuse me of being a Gnostic, but the Gnostic is famous for being absolutely against any kind of literal understanding of the text. And I'm quite a radical literalist. So I'm not a Gnostic. Okay? So, listen to this again. Understanding takes time. There are many obvious metaphors in the text, but when it's not an obvious metaphor, resist trying to invent one. Be comfortable with not knowing. Seek understanding. But we know there's lots of metaphors in the text. Jesus used parables all the time. Those are metaphors. All right? No one's denying that. But our first approach should be a literal one with, with the pursuit of the context. You can't just layer the context over the top of it, or you're starting with a pretext. Okay, 
All right, cycle through emphasizing each word. You know, does that alter the meaning? For, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. You get the drift, right? Cycle through each word in a passage and see, does that shape, does that reframe how it might be understood? All right? Compare various translations. You don't even need to own a physical Bible today. I mean, you should own one, at least, I think. <laughs> it's nothing like having a physical Bible in your hand. You know, sit down and read, take with you and read. Um, but with all of these Bible apps, and I use the Bible study app by Olive Tree. I've used it for twenty more than 20 years since it was on Palm Pilot, <laughs> which doesn't even exist anymore. Um, so... Uh, there, I have 50 different translations uh, at my fingertips, and I could download another 150 more. Um, and so, you know, get the major translations on your Bible. Get the King James, even though you don't want to be using that as a reference because it's a, an atrocious translation. Um, I know all the King James people are going to be so upset now. Um, then you've got... Um, well, even the New King James, NIV, these are not translations I would recommend uh, for studying, okay? Uh, New American Standard Bible, terrific translation, Revised Standard Version. Um, there's some of the more modern ones, the New English Translation, the Net Bible, um, the English Standard Version, um, the God's Word Translation, which I make available, uh, over at godsipod.com in both audio and a physical Bible. That's a really amazing Bible. You can purchase it right through there, godsipod.com. Um, and, and many other translations. Cycle through them and see how are all these translators rendering it. Um, the next one here, look up each word in the Strong's Concordance. Look at the different definitions of the words. Now, the Strong's Concordance... Um, has, oh, this is my interlinear. I thought it was my Strong's for a moment. Um, a Strong's concordance is a listing of every single word in the Hebrew and the Greek manuscripts. Yes, there's a tiny bit of Aramaic there for those that are going to jump in the comments and correct me. Um, and they're all numbered. So we've got numbers starting with H for Hebrew and numbers starting with G for Greek. And therefore, we're able to find things much easier, and they all have a small definition. And then you can get uh, larger dictionaries as well. Now, there's something to consider here. These dictionaries are not the text. And the definitions that are there, although mostly accurate, uh, some of them not quite as much. It's not the be-all and end-all. It's not an authority. It's a helpful tool, and I, I use it. Or I don't, I'm not sure if I have my, my Strong's here. I thought that was it because it was a massive volume. This is a, an interlinear, which is um, the Bible in, in English and, and Hebrew um, and in Greek. And so um, that's handy to have. Sometimes it's better to have a a paper printed uh, book than a piece of software. Um, but you want to look up the word and you want to look up the definitions, um, but it's it's not an authority. The definition might be a little different. Just keep that in mind, okay? Some people want to really make an argument over the definitions in the Strongs. We're going to run into this when we do a study on the word logos, all right, because it's, in my opinion, all the study I've done, understanding context, uh, we mistranslate the word logos, and there's a much simpler way to translate it that fits with everything. Okay. Um, logos has been used to create mystique uh, when it's just a very ordinary, plain thing, actually. So we'll get to that. I don't want to spoil the surprise. We'll, we'll get to that study soon. Are there related passages to consider? What connections are we missing from other parts of the text? Ask more questions. 
The more questions you can find to ask, the more answers you'll have. Just, you've got to pull that that passage apart in every way, shape, or form. You've got to ask all the questions you're not asking. Okay? Last one here. Does Yeshua address the content of the passage? What Yeshua said always takes precedent. It is. It has been said, but I tell you. All right? That's what Jesus said. It has been said, but, like in the law, but I tell you. Okay? Jesus takes precedent. And that includes over anyone in the rest of the New Testament. I have a, a saying I've said for a long time that ups, upsets some people that are you know, believe the Bible is the the inspired word of God, which of course is is blasphemy. Jesus is the word of God. But they, they believe it's some divinely given book from God. It's 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 no, it's it's not that at all. Uh, and they will say that, you know, every word is equal to every other word in the Bible. Um, and that's just not true. No. What what Jesus said, the red letters, overrule everything else. That's how I found the things I found. That's how I found the things I found. Through Jesus. Through putting Jesus first. It's his gospel. It's his message to us. Right? It's his good news. I'm interested in what he said. If anyone says anything that is contradictory to Jesus, I then Jesus just takes precedent. That's all there is to it. Right? So hopefully going through this has kind of given you some idea. Now, I know that <clears throat> you're going to, <clears throat> excuse me, ask, um, where can I get this? I will have this as a PDF for you. Look in the comments uh, in the uh, info panel below this video, uh, I guess I'm talking about on YouTube, where wherever you find this video posted, hopefully there'll be a link there. Uh, I mean, yeah, the easiest thing to do is go to andersondiscoveries.com, all right? Um, that is quite simply the, the best thing to do. Go to andersondiscoveries.com, and there you should be able to find this. All right, thank you for tuning in today. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.